From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Sunday morning session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday morning session of the 192nd semi-annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings and blessings to those of you who are participating in these proceedings throughout the world by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg with Richard Elliott and Brian Mathias at the organ. The choir opened this meeting with how wondrous and great, and will now sing with songs of praise. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Weatherford T. Clayton, who was released from serving as a General Authority 70 yesterday afternoon.
Heavenly Father, with joy we come before you this morning to thank Thee for the blessing of being here in this session of conference. We thank Thee for the blessing of Thy Holy Son, to whom we look for redemption. We thank Thee for our living prophet, for whom we pray, President Russell M. Nelson. We thank Thee for all those who serve in uh, positions of leadership in the kingdom. We ask Thy blessings upon them all. This day we ask Thee to help us open our hearts that we may receive the Word of God, that the seed of faith can be planted in our hearts, that we can nurture it to grow to a, a tree of faith growing to eternal life. Bless us this day to hear the Word of God in this session. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We will now be pleased to hear from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Sister J. Annette Dennis, who serves as First Counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. After her remarks, the choir will sing, You Can Make the Pathway Bright. We will then hear from Elder Garrett W. Gong of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Joseph W. Sitati, who was released yesterday afternoon from serving as a General Authority 70. Elder Holland. Years ago, following a graduate school discussion on American religious history, a fellow student asked me, why have the Latter-day Saints not adopted the cross that other Christians use as a symbol of their faith? Inasmuch as such questions about the cross are often really a question about our commitment to Christ, I immediately told him that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints considers the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ to be the central fact, the crucial foundation, the chief doctrine, and the ultimate expression of divine love in God's grand plan for the salvation of His children. I explained that the saving grace inherent in that act was essential for and universally gifted to the entire human family, from Adam and Eve to the end of the world. I quoted the prophet Joseph Smith, who said, All things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to the atonement of Jesus Christ. Then I read him what Nephi had written 600 years before Jesus' birth. And the angel spake unto me, saying, Look. And I looked and beheld the Lamb of God, who was lifted up upon the cross and slain for the sins of the world. With my love, share, and invite zeal now kicking into high gear, I kept reading. To the Nephites in the New World, the resurrected Christ said, My Father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross that I might draw all men unto me, and for this cause I have been lifted up." I was about to quote the Apostle Paul when I noticed that my friend's eyes were starting to glaze over. A quick look at his wristwatch apparently reminded him that he needed to be somewhere, anywhere. <laughs> and he dashed off to his fictitious appointment. Thus ended our conversation. Well, this morning, some 50 years later, I am determined to finish that explanation. <laughs> Even if every single solitary one of you start looking at your wristwatches. Now, as I attempt 
to explain why we generally do not use the iconography of the cross, I wish to make abundantly clear our deep respect and profound admiration for the faith-filled motives and the devoted lives of those who do. One reason we do not emphasize the cross as a symbol stems from our biblical roots. Because crucifixion was one of the Roman Empire's most agonizing forms of execution, many early followers of Jesus chose not to highlight that brutal instrument of suffering. The meaning of Christ's death was certainly central to their faith. But for some 300 years, they typically sought to convey their gospel identity through other means. By the 4th and 5th centuries, a cross was being introduced as a symbol of generalized Christianity. But ours is not a generalized Christianity. Being neither Catholic nor Protestant, we are rather a restored church, the restored New Testament church. Thus, our origins and our authority go back before the time of councils and creeds and iconography. In this sense, the absence of a symbol that was late coming into common use is yet another evidence that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a restoration of true Christian beginnings. Another reason for not using iconized crosses is the emphasis on the complete miracle of Christ's mission. His glorious resurrection as well as His sacrificial suffering and death. In underscoring that relationship, I note two pieces of art that serve as backdrops for the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in their sacred weekly temple meetings each Thursday in Salt Lake City. These portrayals serve as constant reminders to us of the price that was paid and the victory that was won by Him whose servants we are. A more public representation of Christ's two-part triumph is our use of this small Thorvaldsen image of the resurrected Christ emerging in glory from the tomb with the wounds of His crucifixion still evident. Lastly, we remind ourselves that President Gordon B. Hinckley once taught, the lives of our people must be the symbol of our faith. These considerations, especially the latter, bring me to what may be the most important of all scriptural references to the cross. It has nothing to do with pendants or jewelry or with steeples or signposts. It has to do, rather, with the rock-ribbed integrity and the stiff moral backbone that Christians should bring to the call Jesus has given to every one of His disciples. In every land and age, He has said to us all, If any man or woman will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This speaks of the crosses we bear rather than the ones we wear. To be a follower of Jesus Christ, one must sometimes carry a burden, your own or someone else's, and go where sacrifice is required and suffering is inevitable. A true Christian cannot follow the Master only in those matters with which he or she agrees. No, we follow Him everywhere, including, if necessary, into arenas filled with tears and trouble, where sometimes we may stand very much alone. 
I know people in and out of the church who are following Christ just that faithfully. I know children with severe physical disabilities, and I know the parents who care for them. I see all of them working sometimes to the point of total exhaustion, seeking strength and safety and a few moments of joy that can come no other way. I know many single adults who yearn for and deserve a loving companion, a wonderful marriage, and a home full of children, all their own. No desire could be more righteous. But year after year, such good fortune does not yet come. I know those who are fighting mental illness of many kinds, who plead for help as they pray and pine and claw for the promised land of emotional stability. I know those who live with debilitating poverty, but defying despair, ask only for the chance to make better lives for their loved ones and others, those in need around them. I know many who wrestle with wrenching matters of identity, gender, and sexuality. I weep for them, and I weep with them, knowing how significant the consequences of their decisions will be. These are just a few of so many trying circumstances we may face in life, solemn reminders that there is a cost to discipleship. To Aranya, who attempted to give him free oxen and free wood for his burnt offering, King David said, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price, for I will not offer unto the Lord my God that which doth cost me nothing. So too say we all. As we take up our crosses and follow Him, it would be tragic if indeed the weight of our challenges did not make us more empathetic and more attentive to the burdens being carried by others. It is one of the most powerful paradoxes of the crucifixion that the arms of the Savior were stretched wide open and then nailed there. Unwittingly, but accurately, portraying that every man, woman, and child in the entire human family is not only welcome, but invited into His redeeming, exalting embrace. As the glorious resurrection followed the agonizing crucifixion, so blessings of every kind are poured out on those who are willing, as the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob says, to believe in Christ and view His death and suffer His cross. Sometimes these blessings come soon. Sometimes they come later. But the marvelous conclusion to our personal Via Dolorosa is the promise from the Master Himself that they do and will come. To obtain such blessings, May we follow Him, unfailing, never faltering nor fleeing, never flinching at the task, not when our crosses may be heavy and not when, for a time, the path may grow dark. For your strength and your loyalty and your love, I give deep personal thanks this day. I bear apostolic witness of Him who was lifted up and to the eternal blessings He bestows, even the Lord Jesus Christ.
Amen. The story is told of a man named Jack who had a beloved bird hunting dog named Cassie. Jack was so proud of Cassie and often bragged about what a skilled dog she was. To prove this, Jack invited some friends to watch Cassie perform. After arriving at the hunting club, Jack let Cassie out to run around while he went inside to check in. When it was time to begin, Jack was anxious to show off Cassie's amazing skills However, Cassie was acting strange. She wouldn't obey any of Jack's commands as she usually did so willingly. All she wanted to do was remain by his side. Jack was frustrated and embarrassed and angry with Cassie. Soon he suggested they leave. Cassie wouldn't even jump into the back of the truck, and so Jack impatiently picked her up and shoved her in the kennel. He fumed as those with him made fun of his dog's behavior all the way home. Jack couldn't understand why Cassie was misbehaving. She had been trained well, and her whole desire in the past had been to please and serve him. After arriving home, Jack began examining Cassie for injuries, burrs, or ticks, as he usually did. As he put his hand on her chest, he felt something wet and found his hand covered with blood. To his shame and horror, he found that Cassie had a long, wide gash right to her chest bone. He found another on her right front leg, also to the bone. Jack took Cassie into his arms and began to cry. His shame at how he had misjudged and treated her was overwhelming. Cassie had been acting uncharacteristically earlier in the day because she was hurt. Her behavior had been influenced by her pain, her suffering, and her wounds. It had nothing to do with a lack of desire to obey Jack or a lack of love for him. I heard this story years ago and have never forgotten it. How many wounded individuals do we have among us? How often do we judge others based on their outward appearance and actions or lack of action, when if we fully understood, we would instead react with compassion and a desire to help instead of adding to their burdens with our judgment? I have been guilty of this many times in my life, but the Lord has patiently taught me through personal experiences and as I have listened to the life experiences of many others. I have come to more fully appreciate the example of our dear Savior as He spent so much of His time ministering to others with love. My youngest daughter's life experience has included emotional health challenges from the time she was a little girl. There have been many times throughout her life when she felt like she couldn't go on. We will be forever grateful to the earthly angels who have been there during those times, sitting with her, listening to her, crying with her, as well as sharing together unique gifts, spiritual understandings, and a mutual relationship of love. In such loving circumstances, burdens have often been lifted on both sides. Elder Joseph B. Worthland, quoting 1 Corinthians, said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. He continued, Paul's message to this new body of saints was simple and direct. Nothing you do makes much of a difference if you do not have charity. You can speak with tongues, have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries, possess all knowledge, even if you have the faith to move mountains. Without charity, it won't profit you at all. Charity is the pure love of Christ. The Savior exemplified that love. In John we read, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Many talks have been given by our Church leaders on charity, unity, love, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, and mercy. I believe the Savior is inviting us to live a higher, holier way. 
his way of love, where all can feel they truly belong and are needed. We are commanded to love others, not to judge them. Let's lay down that heavy burden. It isn't ours to carry. Instead, we can pick up the Savior's yoke of love and compassion. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Savior does not condone sin, but offers us his love and extends forgiveness when we repent. To the woman caught in adultery, he said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Those he touched felt his love, and that love healed and transformed them. His love inspired them to want to change their lives. Living his way brings joy and peace, and he invited others to that way of living with gentleness, kindness, and love. Elder Gary E. Stevenson said, when we confront life's wind and rainstorms, sickness and injuries, the Lord, our shepherd, our caregiver, will nourish us with love and kindness. He will heal our hearts and restore our souls. As followers of Jesus Christ, shouldn't we do likewise? The Savior asks us to learn of him and do the things we have seen him do. He is the embodiment of charity, of pure love. As we incrementally learn to do what he asked of us, not out of duty or even for the blessings we might receive, but purely out of love for him and our Heavenly Father, his love will flow through us and make all that he asks not only possible, but eventually much easier and lighter and more joyful than we could ever imagine. It will take practice. It could take years, as it has for me. But as we even desire to have love be our motivating force, he can take that desire, that seed, and eventually turn it into a beautiful tree full of the sweetest fruit. We sing in one of our beloved hymns, Who am I to judge another when I walk imperfectly? In the quiet heart is hidden sorrow that the eye can't see. Who among us might have hidden sorrows? The seemingly rebellious child or teenager, the children of divorce, the single mother or father, those with physical or mental health challenges, those questioning their faith, those who experience racial and cultural prejudice, those feeling alone, those longing to be married, those with unwanted addictions, and so many others dealing with a wide variety of challenging life experiences, often even those whose lives appear perfect on the surface. None of us has perfect lives nor perfect families. I certainly don't. When we seek to empathize with others who also experience challenges and imperfections, it can help them feel that they are not alone in their struggles. Everyone needs to feel that they really do belong and are needed in the body of Christ. Satan's great desire is to divide God's children, and he has been very successful. But there is such power in unity and how we need to walk arm in arm with each other on this challenging journey of mortality. Our prophet, President Russell M. Nelson said, any abuse or prejudice toward another because of nationality, race, sexual orientation, gender, educational degrees, culture, or other significant identifiers is offensive to our maker. Such mistreatment causes us to live beneath our stature as his covenant sons and daughters. While President Nelson has invited all to enter and stay on the covenant path that leads back to our Father in heaven, he also provided the following counsel. If friends and family step away from the church, continue to love them. It is not for you to judge another's choice any more than you deserve to be criticized for staying faithful. Friends, let us remember that each person on this earth is a child of God, and He loves each one. 
Are there people in your path who you have felt inclined to judge? If so, remember that these are valuable opportunities for us to practice loving as the Savior loves. As we follow His example, we can be yoked with Him and help foster a feeling of love and belonging in the hearts of all our Father's children. We love Him because He first loved us. As we are filled with the Savior's love, His yoke truly can be easy and His burden can feel light. Of this I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, dear brothers and sisters, do you remember believing or wanting to believe in happily ever after? Then life happens, we grow up, relationships get complicated. This world is noisy, crowded, pushy with pretense and posturing. Yet in our deep heart's core, we believe or want to believe somewhere, somehow, happy and forever 
are real and possible. Happy and forever are not the imaginary stuff of fairy tales. True enduring joy and eternity with those we love are the very essence of God's plan of happiness. His lovingly prepared way can make our eternal journey happy and forever. We have much to celebrate and for which to be grateful. Yet none of us is perfect, nor is any family. Our relationships include love, sociality, and personality, but often also friction, hurt, sometimes profound pain. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Alive in Jesus Christ includes immortality, his gift of e if physical resurrection. As we live with faith and obedience, alive in Christ can also include joyfully abundant eternal life with God and those we love. In a remarkable way, the Lord's prophet is drawing us closer to our Savior, including through sacred temple ordinances and covenants coming closer to us in more places. We have a profound opportunity and gift to discover new spiritual understanding, love, repentance and forgiveness with each other, our families, in time and eternity. By permission, I share two unusually spiritually direct experiences told by friends about Jesus Christ uniting families by healing even intergenerational conflict, infinite and eternal, stronger than the cords of death, Jesus Christ's atonement can help bring peace to our past and hope to our future. When they joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, my friend and her husband joyfully learned family relationships need not be until death do you part. In the house of the Lord, families can be united eternally, sealed. But my friend did not want to be sealed to her father. Quote, he was not a nice husband to my mother. He was not a nice dad to his children, she said. My dad will have to wait. I do not have any desire to do his temple work and to be sealed with him in eternity. For a year, she fasted, prayed, spoke a lot with the Lord about her father. Finally, she was ready. Her father's temple work was completed. Later, she said, quote, In my sleep, my dad appeared to me in a dream, all dressed in white. He had changed. He said, Look at me. I am all clean. Thank you for doing the work for me in the temple. Her father added, get up and go back to the temple. Your brother is waiting to be baptized. My friend says, my ancestors and those that have passed on are eagerly waiting for their work to be done. As for me, she says, the temple is a place of healing, learning, and acknowledging the atonement of Jesus Christ, end quote. Second experience. Another friend researched diligently his family history. He wanted to identify his great-grandfather. Early one morning, my friend said he felt the spiritual presence of a man in his room. The man wanted to be found and known in his family. The man felt remorse for a mistake for which he had now repented. The man helped my friend realize my friend had no DNA connection with the person my friend thought was his great-grandfather. In other words, my friend said, I had discovered my great-grandfather and learned he was not the person our family records said was our great-grandfather. His family relationships clarified. My friend said, I feel at peace. I feel free. It makes all the difference to know who my family are. My friend muses, a bent branch does not mean a bad tree. How we come into this world is less important than who we are when we leave it. 
the holy scriptures and sacred experiences of personal healing and peace, including those alive in the spirit world, underscore five doctrinal principles. First, central in God's plan of redemption and happiness, Jesus Christ, through his atonement, promises to unite our spirit and body, never again to be divided, that we might receive a fullness of joy. Second, atonement, at one moment in Christ, comes as we exercise faith and bring forth fruits into repentance. As in immortality, so in mortality. Temple ordinances do not of themselves change us or those in the spirit world, but these divine ordinances enable sanctifying covenants with the Lord, which can bring harmony with him and each other. Our joy becomes full as we feel Jesus Christ's grace and forgiveness for us. And as we offer the miracle of his grace and forgiveness to each other, the mercy we receive and the mercy we offer can help make life's injustices just. Third, God knows and loves us perfectly. God is not mocked, nor can he be deceived. With perfect mercy and justice, he encircles in his arms of safety the humble and penitent. In the Kirtland Temple, the prophet Joseph Smith saw in vision his brother Alvin, saved in the celestial kingdom. The prophet Joseph marveled since Alvin had died before receiving the saving ordinance of baptism. Comfortingly, the Lord explained why. The Lord will judge us according to our works, according to the desire of our hearts. Our souls bear record of our works and desires. Gratefully, we know the living and the dead who repent will be redeemed through obedience to the ordinances of the house of God in Christ's atonement. In the spirit world, even those in sin and transgression have opportunity to repent. In contrast, those who deliberately choose wickedness, who consciously procrastinate repentance, or in any premeditated or knowing way break the covenants, planning for easy repentance, will be judged by God and a bright recollection of all their guilt. We cannot knowingly sin on Saturday, then expect automatic forgiveness by partaking of the sacrament on Sunday. To missionaries or others who say following the Spirit means not having to obey mission standards or the commandments, please remember that obeying mission standards and the commandments invite the Spirit. We should none of us put off repentance. The blessings of repentance begin as we begin to repent. Fourth, the Lord gives us divine opportunity to become more like him as we offer proxy-saving temple ordinances others need but cannot do for themselves. We become more complete and perfected as we become saviors on Mount Zion. As we serve others, the Holy Spirit of promise can ratify the ordinances and sanctify both giver and receiver. Both giver and receiver can make and deepen transforming covenants, over time receiving the blessings promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Finally, fifth, as the Golden Rule teaches, a sanctifying symmetry in repentance and forgiveness invites us to offer others that which we ourselves need and desire. Sometimes our willingness to forgive someone else enables both them and us to believe we can repent and be forgiven. Sometimes a willingness to repent and an ability to forgive come at different times. Our Savior is our mediator with God but he also helps bring us to ourselves and each other as we come to him. Especially when hurt and deep and pain are deep, repairing our relationships and healing our hearts is hard, perhaps impossible for us on our own. But heaven can give us strength and wisdom beyond our own 
to know when to hold on and how to let go. We're less alone when we realize we're not alone. Our Savior always understands. With our Savior's help, we can surrender our pride, our hurts, our sins to God. However we may feel as we begin, we become more whole as we trust Him to make our relationships whole. The Lord who sees and understands perfectly forgives whom he will. We, being imperfect, are to forgive all. As we come to our Savior, we focus less on ourselves. We judge less and forgive more. Trusting his merits, mercy, and grace can free us from contention, anger, abuse, abandonment, unfairness, and the physical and mental challenges that sometimes come with the physical body in a mortal world. Happy and forever do not mean that every relationship will be happy and forever. But a thousand millennial years when Satan is bound may give us needed time and surprising ways to love, understand, and work things out as we prepare for eternity. We find heaven's sociality in each other. God's work and glory include bringing to pass happy and forever. Eternal life and exaltation are to know God in Jesus Christ, so through godly power, where they are, we shall be. Dear brothers and sisters, God our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son live. They offer peace, joy, and healing to every kindred and tongue, to each of us. The Lord's prophet is leading the way. Latter-day revelation continues. May we draw closer to our Savior in the holy house of the Lord, and may he draw us closer to God and each other as we knit our hearts together in Christ-given compassion, truth, and mercy in time and eternity, happy and forever. In Jesus Christ it is possible. In Jesus Christ it is true. I so witness in his holy name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. This morning, our two children and three grandchildren in North America and about half of the world saw the brightness of the sun rising majestically in the east. The other three children and seven grandchildren in Africa and the other half of the world saw darkness gradually creep upon them as the sun sank over the horizon in the west. This timeless constancy of the onset of day and night is one daily reminder of realities that govern our lives that we cannot change. When we respect and align what we do with these eternal realities, we experience internal peace and harmony. When we don't, we are unsettled, and things do not work as we expect. Day and night is one example of patterns that God has given to everyone who has ever lived on the earth of things as they really are. It is an absolute truth of our human existence that we cannot negotiate around according to our own desires and get away with it. I am reminded of this every time I take a flight from Africa to come to General Conference, resetting the body clock backwards by 10 hours in one day. Whenever we care to notice, we see that Heavenly Father has given us sufficient witnesses of truth to govern our lives so we will know him and have the blessings of peace and joy. Through the prophet Joseph Smith, the Spirit of the Lord affirms, quote, and again, I'll give unto you a pattern in all things that ye may not be deceived, for Satan is abroad in the land and he goeth forth deceiving the nations." Close quote. Koriho, the Antichrist, fell for such deception, disbelieving the existence of God and the coming of Christ. 
To him, the prophet Alma testified, all things denote there is a God, yeah, even the earth, and all things that are upon the face of it, yeah, and its motion, yeah, and also all the planets which move in their regular form do witness that there is a supreme creator, close quote. When Koriho insisted to be given a sign before he could believe, Alma caused him to be struck dumb. Humbled by his affliction, Koriho freely confessed to having been deceived by the devil. We do not need to be deceived. The miracle of intelligent life constantly plays before us. And a brief gaze and reflection upon the wonders of the heavens arrayed with numberless stars and galaxies prompts the soul of the believing heart to proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Yes, God our Heavenly Father lives, and he manifests himself to us all the time in multiple ways. But to acknowledge, believe, and continue in God, our hearts need to be receptive to the spirit of truth. Alma taught that faith is preceded by humility. Mormon added that it is impossible for anyone who is not meek and lowly in heart to have faith and hope and to receive the spirit of God. King Benjamin declared that anyone who prioritizes the glory of the world is an enemy to God. By submitting to baptism to fulfill all righteousness, even though he was righteous and holy, Jesus Christ demonstrated that humility before God is a foundational attribute of his disciples. All new disciples are required to demonstrate humility before God through the ordinance of baptism thus, quote, all those who humble themselves before God and desire to be baptized and come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits shall be received by baptism into his church." Close quote. Humility inclines the heart of the disciple towards repentance and obedience. The Spirit of God is then able to bring truth to that heart, and it will find entry. It is lack of humility that contributes most to the fulfillment of the Apostle Paul's prophecy in these last days, quote, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fears, despisers of those that are good." Close quote. The invitation of the Savior to learn of him is an invitation to turn away from the enticings of worldliness and to become as he is, meek and lowly of heart, humble. We are then able to take up his yoke and discover that it is easy the discipleship is not a burden but a joy, as President Nelson has so eloquently and repeatedly taught us. Learning about Christ and his ways leads us to know and to love him. He showed by example that with an attitude of humility, it is indeed possible to know and to love God the Father with all our being and to love others as we love ourselves, holding back nothing. His ministry on the earth, during which he put both his will and his body on the altar, was a pattern for the application of these principles on which his gospel is founded. Both principles are outward looking and are about how we relate to others, not about seeking personal gratification or glory. The miraculous irony of it is that when we focus our best efforts on loving God and others, we are enabled to discover our own true divine worth as sons and daughters of God with the complete peace and joy that this experience brings. 
We become one with God and with one another through love and service. Then we can receive the witness of the Holy Ghost of that pure love, the fruit which Lehi speaks about as most sweet above all that I ever before tasted. The crown that Christ received by giving and doing all in his ability to set the pattern of loving the Father and loving us was to receive all power, even all that the Father has, which is exaltation. Our opportunity to nurture in our souls a lasting love of God and of our neighbor starts at home with the holy habits of connecting with the Father daily in personal and family prayer in the name of His only begotten Son, learning together of them through individual and family scripture study, observing the Sabbath day together, and individually holding, holding a current temporary command and using it to, together as often as we are able. As we each individually grow in our knowledge and love of the Father and the Son, we grow in appreciation and love one for another. Our ability to love and serve others outside the home is greatly enhanced. What we do at home is the true crucible of enduring and joyful discipleship. The sweetest blessings of the gospel of the restored gospel that my wife Gladys and I have enjoyed in our household have come from learning to know and to honor God at home and to share his love with our posterity. Love for God and serving to one another, nurtured at home, and service to others outside the home in time grows into the attribute of charity. This resonates with the pattern of consecrated service in the kingdom of God that is set before us by the Lord's living prophets and apostles. We become one with them. We are then enabled to look through them unto the Lord in every thought, so that we shall doubt not, nor fear not. Like the Lord's living prophets and apostles, we can go forth with bowels full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith, with virtue garnishing our thoughts unceasingly and our confidence waxing strong in the presence of God and the doctrine of the priesthood distilling upon our souls as the dews from heaven. With the Lord's living prophets and apostles, we too can join a virtuous circle of faith strengthened by consecrated service in which the Holy Ghost is our constant companion. Our scepter is an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth, and our dominion is an everlasting dominion, and without compulsory means, it flows unto us forever and ever. For this is the promise of the Father's plan. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. As directed, the congregation will join the choir in singing, We thank thee, O God, for a prophet. After the singing, we will hear from President Stephen J. Lund, who serves as Young Men General President. He will be followed by Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This is the Sunday morning session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
During this past summer, over 200,000 of our young people all over the world grew in faith at one of the hundreds of week-long sessions of For Strength of Youth, or FSY conferences, coming as they were out of a world of pandemic isolation, for many it was an act of faith in the Lord to even attend. Many of the young participants seemed to follow a similar upward arc towards deeper conversion. At the end of their week, I like to ask them, so how's it been? And they sometimes said something like this, well, on Monday, I was so annoyed with my mother because she made me come and do this and I didn't know anybody and I didn't think it was for me and I wouldn't have any friends, but now it's Friday and I just want to stay here. I just want to feel the spirit in my life. I want to live like this. They each have their own stories to tell of moments of clarity and of spiritual gifts washing through them and carrying them along that arc of growth. I too was changed this summer of FSY as I have seen the Spirit of God relentlessly responding to the righteous desires of the individual hearts of these young multitudes who individually found the courage to trust Him with a week in His keeping. Like brightly hulled steel ships at sea, we live in a spiritually corrosive environment where the most gleaming convictions must be mindfully maintained or they can etch and then corrode and then crumble away. Experiences like FSY conferences and camps and missions and sacrament meetings can help to burnish our testimonies, taking us through arcs of growth and spiritual discovery to places of relative peace. But what must we do to stay there and continue to press forward with a steadfastness in Christ rather than slipping backwards? Well, we must continue to do those things that brought us there in the first place, like praying often, drenching ourselves in scripture and serving sincerely. For some of us, it may require an exercise in trusting in the Lord even to attend sacrament meeting. But once there, the healing influence of the Lord's sacrament, infusions of gospel principles, and the nurture of the church community can send us home on higher ground. At FSY, a couple of hundred thousand and more of our youth came to better know the Savior by using a simple formula of coming together where two or more of them were gathered in his name, engaging the gospel and the scriptures, singing together, praying together, and finding peace in Christ. This is a powerful prescription for spiritual awakening. Now this far-flung band of young brothers and sisters has gone home to determine what it means to still trust in the Lord when swept up in the cacophony of a rambunctious world. It's one thing to hear him in our quiet place of contemplation with scriptures wide open, but it is quite another thing to carry our discipleship into this mortal flurry of distractions where we must strive to hear him even through the blur of self-concern and faltering confidence. Let there be no doubt, it is the very stuff of heroes displayed by our youth when they set their hearts and minds to standing up upright against the shifting moral tectonics of our time. I once served as husband to the stake young women's president. One night I was tasked with arranging cookies in the foyer while my wife was conducting a fireside in the chapel for parents and their daughters preparing to attend young women's camp the next week. After she explained where they needed to be and what to bring, she said, now Tuesday morning when you drop your sweet girls off at the bus, you hug them tight and you kiss them goodbye because they're not coming back. I heard someone gasp and then I realized it was me <laughs> not coming back. But then she continued, she said, when you drop those Tuesday morning girls off, they will leave behind the distraction of lesser things and spend a week together learning and growing 
and trusting in the Lord. We will pray together and sing and cook and serve together and share testimonies together and do the things that allow us to feel Heavenly Father's Spirit all week long until it soaks all the way into our bones. And on Saturday, those girls that you see getting off that bus will not be the ones you dropped off on Tuesday. They will be new creatures. And if you help them continue from that higher plane, they will astonish you. They will continue to change and to grow, and so will your family. Well, on that Saturday, it was just as she predicted. As I was loading tents, I heard my wife's voice off in the little woodsy amphitheater where the girls had gathered before heading for home. I heard her say, Oh, there you are. We've been watching for you all week, our Saturday girls. The stalwart youth of Zion are voyaging through stunning times, finding joy in this world of prophesied disruption without becoming part of that world with its blind spot toward holiness is their particular charge. About a hundred years ago, G.K. Chesterton spoke almost as though he saw this quest as being home-centered and church-supported when he said, we have to feel the universe at once as an ogre's castle to be stormed and yet as our own cottage to which we can return to at evening. Thankfully, they don't have to go out into battle alone. They have each other and they have you. And they follow a living prophet President Russell M. Nelson, who leads with the knowing optimism of a seer in proclaiming that the great endeavor of these times, the gathering of Israel, will be both grand and majestic. This summer, my wife Colleen and I were changing planes in Amsterdam, where many years earlier I was a new missionary, when, or, when after months of struggling to learn Dutch, our group's KLM flight was landing, and the captain made an incoherent announcement over the PA system. After a moment of silence, my companion mumbled, I think that was Dutch. <laughs> we glanced up, reading each other's, thought, each other's thoughts. All was lost. <laughs> but all was not lost. As I marveled, over the leaps of faith that we had taken then as my companions walked through this airport on our way to the miracles that would rain down upon us as missionaries. I was abrupt, brought abruptly back to the present by a living, breathing missionary who was boarding a plane home. He introduced himself and asked President Lund, what do I do now? What do I do to remain strong? Well, this is the same question that is on the minds of our youth when they leave FSY conferences and youth camps and temple trips and any time they feel the powers of heaven. How can loving God turn into lasting discipleship? I felt an upwelling of love for this missionary serving the last hours of his mission in that momentary stillness of the spirit. And I heard my voice crack as I said simply, you don't have to wear the badge to bear his name. I wanted to put my hands on his shoulders and say, here's what you do. You go home and you just be this. You are so good, you almost glow in the dark. Your mission dis disciplines and sacrifices have made you a magnificent son of God. Keep doing at home what has worked so powerfully for you here. You've learned to pray and to whom you pray and the language of prayer. You have studied his words and come to love the Savior by trying to be like him. You've loved Heavenly Father like he loved his Father, served others like he served others, and, and lived the commandments like he lived them. And when you didn't, you've repented. Your discipleship isn't just a slogan on a t-shirt. It has become a part of your life, purposely lived for others. So you go home and you do that be that. Carry this spiritual momentum into the rest of your life. I know that through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and His covenant path, we can find spiritual confidence and peace as we nurture holy habits and righteous routines 
that can sustain and fuel the fires of our faith. May we each move ever closer to those warming fires and come what may remain. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Parables are a defining feature of the Lord Jesus Christ's masterful approach to teaching. Simply described, the Savior's parables are stories used to compare spiritual truths with material things and mortal experiences. For example, the New Testament Gospels are replete with teachings likening the kingdom of heaven to a grain of mustard seed, to a pearl of great price, to a householder and laborers in his vineyard, to ten virgins and many, many others. During part of the Lord's Galilean ministry, the scriptures indicate that without a parable spake he not unto them. The intended meaning of a, or message of a parable typically is not expressed explicitly. Rather, the story only conveys divine truth to a receiver in proportion to his or her faith in God, personal spiritual preparation, and willingness to learn. Thus, an individual must exercise moral agency and actively ask, seek, and knock to discover the truths embedded in a parable. I earnestly pray that the Holy Ghost will enlighten each of us as we now consider the importance of the parable of the royal marriage feast. And Jesus spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. In ancient times, one of the most joyous occasions in Jewish life was a wedding celebration, an event that would span a week or even two. Such an event required extensive planning, and guests were informed far in advance with a reminder sent on the opening day of the festivities. An invitation from a king to his subjects to a wedding such as this was essentially considered a command. Yet many of the bidden guests in this parable did not come. The refusal to attend the king's feast was a deliberate act of rebellion against royal authority and a personal indignity against both the reigning sovereign and his son. The turning away by one man to his farm and by another to his business interests reflect their misguided priorities and total disregard of the king's will. The parable continues, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. The custom in those days was for the host of a wedding feast, in this parable the king, to provide garments for the wedding guests. Such wedding garments were simple, nondescript robes that all attendees wore. In this way, rank and station were eliminated, and everyone at the feast could mingle as equals. People invited from the highways to attend the wedding would not have had the time or means to procure appropriate attire in preparation for the event. Consequently, the king likely gave guests the garments from his own wardrobe. 
Everyone was given the opportunity to clothe themselves in the garments of royalty. As the king entered the wedding hall, he surveyed the audience and immediately noticed that one conspicuous guest was not wearing a wedding garment. The man was brought forward, and the king asked, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. In essence, the king asked, Why are you not wearing a wedding garment even though one was provided for you? The man obviously was not dressed properly for the special occasion, and the phrase, and he was speechless, indicates that the man was without excuse. Elder James E. Talmadge provides this instructive commentary about the significance of the man's actions. Quote, that the unrobed guest was guilty of neglect, intentional disrespect, or some more grievous offense is plain from the context. The king at first was graciously considerate inquiring only as to how the man had entered without a wedding garment. Had the man been able to explain his exceptional appearance, or had he any reasonable excuse to offer, he surely would have spoken, but we are told he remained speechless. Elder Talmadge continues, The king's summons had been freely extended to all whom his servants had found. But each of them had to enter the royal palace by the door, and before reaching the banquet room in which the king would appear in person, each would be properly attired. But the deficient one by some means had entered by another way, and not having passed the attendant sentinels at the portal, he was an intruder." Close quote. A Christian author, John O. Reed, noted, that the man's refusal to wear the wedding garment exemplified blatant disrespect for both the king and his son. He did not simply lack a wedding garment, rather he chose not to wear one. He rebelliously refused to dress appropriately for the occasion. The king's reaction was swift and decisive. Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth." Now, brothers and sisters, the king's judgment of the man is not based primarily upon the lack of a wedding garment, but that he was, in fact, determined not to wear one. The man desired the honor of attending the wedding feast, but did not want to follow the custom of the king. He wanted to do things his own way. His lack of proper dress revealed his inner rebellion against the king and his instructions. This parable then concludes with this penetrating scripture, For many are called, but few are chosen. Interestingly, the prophet Joseph Smith made the following adjustment to this verse from Matthew in his inspired translation of the Bible. For many are called, but few are chosen. Wherefore, all do not have on the wedding garment. The invitation to the wedding feast and the choice to partake in the feast are related but different. The invitation is to all men and women. An individual may even accept the invitation and sit down at the feast, yet not be chosen to partake because he or she does not have the appropriate wedding garment of converting faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in His divine grace. Thus, we have both God's call and our individual response to that call, and many may be called but few chosen. To be or to become chosen is not an exclusive status conferred upon us. Rather, you and I ultimately can choose to be chosen through the righteous exercise of our moral agency. 
Please note the use of the word chosen in the following familiar verses from the Doctrine and Covenants. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men. I believe the implication of these verses is quite straightforward. God does not have a list of favorites to which we must hope our names will someday be added. He does not limit the chosen to a restricted few. Instead, our hearts, our desires, our honoring of sacred gospel covenants and ordinances, our obedience to the commandments, and most importantly, the Savior's redeeming grace and mercy determine whether we are counted as one of God's chosen. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. In the busyness of our daily lives and in the commotion of the contemporary world in which we live, we may be distracted from the eternal things that matter the most by making pleasure, prosperity, popularity, and prominence our primary priorities. Our short-term preoccupation with the things of the world and the honors of men may lead us to forfeit our spiritual birthright for far less than a mess of pottage. I repeat the admonition of the Lord to His people delivered through the Old Testament prophet Haggai. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Each of us should evaluate our temporal and spiritual priorities sincerely and prayerfully to identify the things in our lives that may impede the bounteous blessings that Heavenly Father and the Savior are willing to bestow upon us. And surely the Holy Ghost will help us to see ourselves as we really are. As we appropriately seek for the spiritual gift of eyes to see and ears to hear, I promise that we will be blessed with the capacity and judgment to strengthen our individual covenant connection with the living Lord. We also will receive the power of godliness in our lives and ultimately be both called to and chosen for the Lord's feast. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, for Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness. Her borders must be enlarged, her stakes must be strengthened. Yea, verily I say unto you, Zion must arise and put on her beautiful garments. I joyfully declare my witness of the divinity and living reality of God, our eternal Father, and of His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. I testify that Jesus Christ is our Savior and Redeemer, and He lives. And I also witness that the Father and the Son appeared to the boy Joseph Smith, thus initiating the restoration of the Savior's gospel in the latter days. May each of us seek for and be blessed with eyes to see and ears to hear, I pray, in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We are grateful to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square for the inspiring music they have provided this morning. The choir will now favor us with how great the wisdom and the love. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following President Nelson's remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, Let Us All Press On. The benediction will then be offered by President Bonnie H. Corden,
who serves as Young Women General President. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm grateful to greet you on this glorious Sabbath morning. You are constantly on my mind. I marvel at the way you spring into action whenever you see others in need. I stand amazed at the faith and testimony you demonstrate again and again. I weep over your heartaches disappointments, and worries. I love you. I assure you that our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, love you. They are intimately aware 
of your circumstances, your goodness, your needs, and your prayers for help. Again and again, I pray for you to feel their love for you. Experiencing their love is vital, as it seems that we are accosted daily by an onslaught of sobering news. You may have had days when you wished you could don your pajamas, curl up in a ball, and ask someone to awaken you when the turmoil is over. <laughs> but, my dear brothers and sisters, so many wonderful things are ahead. In coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns with power and great glory, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. Nonetheless, we are presently living in what surely is a most complicated time in the history of the world. The complexities and challenges leave many people feeling overwhelmed and exhausted. However, consider a recent experience that might shed light on how you and I can find rest. During the recent open house of the Washington, D.C. Temple, a member of the open house committee witnessed an insight and an interchange as he escorted several prominent journalists through the temple. Somehow, a young family became attached to this media tour. One reporter kept asking about the journey of temple patrons as he or she moved through the temple. He wanted to know if the temple journey is symbolic of the challenges in a person's journey through life. A young boy in the family picked up on the conversation. When the tour group entered an endowment room, the boy pointed to the altar where people kneel to make covenants with God and said, Oh, that's nice. Here's a place for people to rest on their temple journey. I doubt that the boy knew just how profound his observation was. He likely had no idea about the direct connection between making a covenant with God in the temple and the Savior's stunning promise. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Dear brothers and sisters, I grieve for those who leave the Church because they feel membership requires too much of them. They have not yet discovered that making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. Each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts, in temples, and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ. Please ponder that stunning truth. The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to His higher power. Thus, covenant keepers are entitled to a special kind of rest that comes to them through their covenantal relationship with God. Before the Savior submitted himself to the agony of Gethsemane and Calvary, 
he declared to his apostles, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Subsequently, Jesus entreated each of us to do the same when he said, I will that ye should overcome the world. Dear brothers and sisters, my message to you today is that because Jesus Christ overcame this fallen world and because he atoned for each of us, you too can overcome this sin-saturated, self-centered, and often exhausting world. Because the Savior, through his infinite atonement, redeemed each of us from weakness, mistakes, and sin. And because he experienced every pain, worry, and burden you have ever had, then as you truly repent and seek his help, you can rise above this present precarious world. You can overcome the spiritually and emotionally exhausting plagues of the world, including arrogance, pride, anger, immorality, hatred, greed, jealousy, and fear, Despite the distractions and distortions that swirl around us, you can find true rest, meaning relief and peace, even amid your most vexing problems. This important truth prompts three fundamental questions. First, what does it mean to overcome the world? Second, how do we do it? And third, how does overcoming the world bless our lives? What does it mean to overcome the world? It means overcoming the temptation to care more about things of this world than the things of God. It means trusting the doctrines of Christ more than the philosophies of men. It means delighting in truth, denouncing deception, and becoming humble followers of Christ. It means choosing to refrain from anything that drives the Spirit away. It means being willing to give away even our favorite sins. Now, overcoming the world certainly does not mean becoming perfect in this life, nor does it mean that your problems will magically evaporate, because they won't. And it does not mean that you won't still mistake, make mistakes. But overcoming the world does mean that your resistance to sin will increase. Your heart will soften as your faith in Jesus Christ increases. Overcoming the world means growing to love God and his beloved Son more than you love anyone or anything else. How then do we overcome the world? King Benjamin taught us how. He said that the natural man is an enemy to God and remains so forever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. Each time you seek for and follow the promptings of the Spirit, each time you do anything good, things that the natural man would not do, you are overcoming the world. Overcoming the world is not an event that happens in a day or two. It happens over a lifetime, 
as we repeatedly embrace the doctrine of Christ. We cultivate faith in Jesus Christ by repenting daily and keeping covenants that endow us with power. We stay on the covenant path and are blessed with spiritual strength, personal revelation, increasing faith, and the ministering of angels. Living the doctrine of Christ can produce the most powerful, virtuous cycle, creating spiritual momentum in our lives. As we strive to live the higher laws of Jesus Christ, our hearts and our very natures begin to change. The Savior lifts us above the pull of this fallen world by blessing us with greater charity, humility, generosity, kindness, self-discipline, peace, and rest. Now, you may be thinking this sounds more like hard spiritual work rather than rest. But here's the grand truth. While the world insists that power, possessions, popularity, and pleasures of the flesh bring happiness, they do not. They cannot. What they do produce is nothing but a hollow substitute for the blessed and happy state of those who keep the commandments of God. The truth is that it is much more exhausting to seek, seek happiness where you can never find it. However, when you yoke yourself to Jesus Christ and do the spiritual work required to overcome the world, he and he alone does have the power to lift you above the pull of this world. Now, how does overcoming the world bless our lives? The answer is clear. Entering into a covenant relationship with God binds us to him in a way that makes everything about life easier. Please do not misunderstand me. I did not say that making covenants makes life easy. In fact, expect opposition because the adversary does not want you to discover the power of Jesus Christ. But yoking yourself with a Savior means you have access to his strength and redeeming power. I reaffirm a profound teaching of President Ezra Taft Benson. Quote, Men and women who turn their lives over to God will discover that he can make a lot more out of their lives than they can. He will deepen their joys, expand their vision, quicken their minds, lift their spirits, multiply their blessings, increase their opportunities, comfort their souls, raise up friends, and pour out peace." Close quote. These incomparable challenges follow those who seek the support of heaven to help them overcome this world. To this end, I extend to members of the entire church the same charge I gave to our young adults last May. I urge them then, and I plead with you now, to take charge of your own testimony of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Work for it, nurture it so that it will grow, feed it truth, don't pollute it with false philosophies of unbelieving men and women. As you make the continual strengthening of your testimony of Jesus Christ your highest priority, watch for miracles to happen in your life. My plea to you this morning is to find rest from the intensity, uncertainty, 
and anguish of this world by overcoming the world through your covenants with God. Let him know through your prayers and your actions that you are serious about overcoming the world. Ask him to enlighten your mind and send the help you need. Each day record the thoughts that come to you as you pray. Then follow through diligently. Spend more time in the temple and seek to understand how the temple teaches you how to rise above this fallen world. As I've stated before, the gathering of Israel is the most important work taking place on earth today. One crucial element of this gathering is preparing a people who are able, ready, and worthy to receive the Lord when he comes again, a people who have already chosen Jesus Christ over this fallen world, a people who rejoice in their agency to live the higher, holier laws of Jesus Christ. I call upon you, my dear brothers and sisters, to become this righteous people. Cherish and honor your covenant above all other commitments. As you let God prevail in your life, I promise you greater peace, confidence, joy, and yes, rest. With the power of the Holy Apostleship vested in me, I bless you in your quest to overcome this world. I bless you to increase your faith in Jesus Christ and learn better how to draw upon his power. I bless you to be able to discern truth from error. I bless you to care more about the things of God than the things of this world. I bless you to see the needs of those around you and strengthen those you love. Because Jesus Christ overcame this world, you can too. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we love Thee. We love Thy Son, Jesus Christ. We are so grateful for the music that has stirred our soul and pointed us to the Savior. We're grateful for each one of the messages. We're grateful for the spiritual promptings. And seek to have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts open to respond to those promptings. Father, we are so grateful for a prophet, a living prophet. We rejoice in his message. May we strive to overcome the world through our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we have increased spiritual capacity to understand the message that was given. Father, we love thy Son, Jesus Christ, and are grateful for the matchless gift of his life. And we give thanks. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. This has been a broadcast of the Sunday morning session of the 192nd Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>